Did you know anything about Pearl Harbor? I did not. I, no, it was a, a brand new name to me. I, I did know that we had a Pacific fleet and they, they were in Hawaii someplace, but the, the, the Pearl Harbor as such, I was not, not familiar with it. So I did become very familiar with it later on. So. <laughs> I'm sure you did, yeah. Well, tell me how you got into the Navy. Well, I'd always admired the Navy in one way or another, and uh, I had uh, been looking for a, a place to join the services before being drafted, and there had been an article in the paper uh, early in 1940s, 42, after the war started, saying that the Navy was interested in uh, recruiting officers, uh, people that had a college education and uh, certain other things. They were, <clears throat> they were building a, the Navy was building a large amphibious fleet in anticipation of the things to come in the Pacific, and uh, they needed officers. So that uh, when the next few months rolled by, I, it became a, uh, a solid uh, opportunity, and uh, I made an application for what they called a a probationary um, commission in which they actually gave me a commission based on my successfully finishing a course of indoctrination and other good things. So I became a probationary ensign um, and that started it all. So. Why the Navy? Uh, <clears throat> I'd always admired the fact that it didn't live in the mud and uh, other unpleasant places. You took your chances like everybody else, but at least you had a, a nice place to live and eat. You know? And as I say, it always sort of appealed to me. So I did it. What was your training like when you went in to a basic training and officer training? What was that like? Uh, I'm not totally uh, remembering all of that, but uh, I was <coughs> assigned to go to Navy training, Navy training school at Princeton University. Uh, and my orders sent me there. Uh, the school was uh, approximately 90 days, three months, and uh, that was the, there was a bunch of other programs that all the services were running to train officers. Now, this is the only one that I know of that they actually gave you the commission first and you had to prove your worth, secondly. But we were taught celestial navigation, uh, the history of the Navy, and uh, whatever they could be teaching about uh, seamanship on a dry land basis. It was a little, uh, nothing like on the, uh, training on the job. Um, and, and as I said before, they were most interested in equipping the upcoming amphibious fleet with, with officers. So I had no idea what my future might be <clears throat> up until the day that I was called into the uh, commander's office in 
told me what my next step was going to be. So. How did your family feel about your going in? Were they anxious about it? Were they nervous? Oh, I don't think that there was any question but what they were 100% behind me on that. And uh, it was, uh, I had, as far as I know, I had no relations that had been Navy people. But uh, at the time, you know, everybody was going to go do their part. So. People were 100% behind the armed forces at that time. So. Well, they must have been somewhat afraid for you, so, right? They must have been somewhat afraid for you. Oh, I'm sure that they were. It, uh, uh, military is not the safest job in the world, and particularly at, a, at the pace it was happening. And we were being soundly defeated at the time. Uh, it was going to take some turning around. So the amphibious forces were ramping up. Yes, they were ramping up. And, uh, I had, as I said, I had no idea what I was going to be assigned to, but to put some things in perspective, I was, <clears throat> I was 24 at the time, 24 years of age. And most of the people that uh, were at the school with me were older. Uh, I would say in 30s and maybe some of them in the 40s. And uh, not to say that there weren't other people my age, but I think we were in the minority. And, uh, <clears throat> They were they were looking for experience and various things, um, small boat experience, and of which I had only a smattering of it. And I told them that to begin with, and they said, "As long as you know where the water edge is, I think you're all right." <laughs> um, but the uh, surprise came when the uh, Commander said, well, we have, have you slated to go to the anti-submarine warfare school in Miami. And when you're through there, you will be assigned to a, a sub-chaser or escort vessel of some kind. And uh, for which I thought that was, that was very good. And... Uh, we went from there. So. Was there a need for sub-chasers? Absolutely. The, uh, the anti-submarine warfare abilities of the Navy were very, very small at the time of Pearl Harbor. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the vessels that made the initial contact at Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December was a relic of World War I called a force stacker, a destroyer. There were new destroyers coming along and eventually there were destroyer escorts and they were building patrol craft. Uh, even here in Pittsburgh, Dravo Corporation was building PCs, patrol craft, and uh, so I spent the next, uh, well, I had a few few weeks off and then went to the anti-submarine warfare school at Miami for three months, and uh, we did lots of uh, ship training with school school ships uh, out off of the coast of Miami and were acclimated to the real life aboard a small vessel. 
The PC was a little less than 200 feet long, steel hulled, and um, it was a smaller one, called it SC. It was a 110 foot long wooden hulled vessel, but fortunately I was assigned to one of the steel hulled ships and I was happy about that. Why is that? Well, the other one was very small and cramped, and uh, I didn't think that I'd like to be in serious weather in a 110-foot vessel. I'd rather do it in a 200-foot vessel. Uh, the, uh, it, it, it is, the Lord says, uh, my ocean is very big and those ships are very small. Were they dangerous? Uh, I think any ship is dangerous under the worst conditions, but uh, no, they were very seaworthy. We, we experienced some very serious weather and rode through them miraculously, I would say, but uh, uh, danger lurks at all times in the military. You know. What were the biggest dangers, though, or biggest threats to your ship? Uh, outside of uh, enemy action, uh, say the weather. Uh, later on in my my experience, we were operating in the Aleutian Islands, uh, in the Bering Sea, in the North Pacific, and 40-foot waves were not uncommon. It was terrifying. <laughs> I bet. But uh, we always managed to come upside, come right side up. <laughs> and uh, so, but that, that wasn't an everyday occurrence by any means, so mostly we, we did uh, convoy duty with big ships, I mean, big cargo vessels, big personnel vessels as part of the anti-submarine screen and uh, we were accepted as being little boys out there helping the big boys. So, Now, would the enemy come after you? I mean, submarines wouldn't come after you, would they? Not necessarily, no, but I, I'm sure that they, they could have and might have. But uh, this, my, all, my total experience was in the Pacific Ocean area which was completely different than that in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. But the Japanese <clears throat> did not use submarines as actively as the Germans did. Their, their submarines were used many times for supplying their garrisons in the dead of night and uh, with people and material and all that. Were PCs known to be um, targeted by the enemy? I mean, did they take take planes after you or other small ships after you? Not necessarily. The, uh, later on, in the, uh, at the end of the war, when the kamikazes were active in the Philippines and at Iwo Jima and at Okinawa. They didn't particularly care what they were attacking. Uh, they, they might not necessarily pick out some smaller vessel like that, but they could misinterpret their size from the air and uh, the outline of the vessel was similar to that of a destroyer and it's a much smaller scale. So they could have mistaken us for a destroyer at times. But, you know, but I, 
I don't think we were unnecessarily singled out for what we were or what we were doing. You, know. you were small fish. Small ship in a big ocean. Yeah. What kind of uh, armament did you have on there? Did you feel safe that you had enough firepower? I did. Uh, you could always want more. But uh, we had uh, anti-aircraft uh, guns. We had a, a uh, three-inch forward uh, gun mounted on the bow that would could be used against uh, surface targets. And, um, we had uh, rifles uh, and ammunition too. It was part of the standard armament of all ships to repel borders. <laughs> it was sort of a throwback to 100 years ago. But, we had them anyhow, and, uh, and we had depth charges, a lot of big black cans with 300 pounds of TNT in them. Yeah. And 300 pounds? Yes, 300 pounds of TNT. And the object was, it was, a forerunner of very sophisticated inf attack information that we have the present day. It, the submarines weren't that fast, and uh, they were not nuclear. And it was sufficed for the time. That, uh, the object was to get a echo on your sound your echo ranging equipment sonar and uh, pursue it, plot its course and speed and try to intercept it uh, and drop these big uh, 300 pound cans of TNT close by or on top of them. <laughs> Were you successful? Did you have engagements? We made several attacks on what we presumed was a submarine, but never was conclusive. And we had to submit the information to the people in Washington any time that that happened. And about six months later, we'd get a report back uh, saying insufficient evidence of submarine. <laughs> but it, it killed a lot of fish, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> yeah. what, what would signal that you got a submarine? How would you know? Mostly there would be debris on the surface. Uh, f floats them from uh, whatever it might have been loose in the submarine or a heavy oil slick or things of that nature, you know, something we never saw. Tell me about your ship. Now it was, what was the name of it? It didn't have a name, it had a number. USS PC 578. And- uh, Well, that's not very catchy. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, They changed our uh, our designation as PCC. The last C was for control. Um, at Pearl Harbor, where we were stationed, um, we got orders to take the ship to the repair basin and do modifications to make us to a, a control ship. So <clears throat> we eventually became part of the amphibious forces, uh, but our, our job was twofold, to escort uh, ships to the 
landing site of a, of a operation and pro provide control for the individual landing craft that would form a line of departure a thousand, maybe 2,000 yards offshore. And we were under radio control with the, with the uh, flotilla commander. And they would <coughs> be disembarked from the large vessels and form into a horizontal line between various other components of a control ship spread out several miles along a beach. And they would take their bearings on us. And when the signal to go, they would go. So we just merely formed a, a piece of geography for them. And uh, we, we did dual duty. We did our anti-submarine and then we did the control ship. We had uh, a lot of, for that time, uh, period of time, we had a lot of sophisticated radio gear and uh, extra radio people. And as a matter of fact, we had a, a team of Navajo Indians, the code talkers aboard ship at the invasion of Iwo Jima, which was very interesting. Um, but that's what we did till the end of the war. And we did our, uh, our invasion thing at Okinawa in the summer of April 1st of 1945, Sunday, Easter Sunday, April 1st. Um, so you were involved in Iwo Jima? Yes. We we made the uh, after we got all outfitted we sailed out of Pearl Harbor with a convoy of part of the invasion fleet and escorted them to Iwo and uh, made the invasion stayed around there for several weeks um, and then we. We rehearsed the invasion for Okinawa on an island down in the Philippines. And um, after the invasion of Okinawa, we spent the summer convoying back and forth between the Philippines and Okinawa and running anti-submarine patrols around Okinawa and joining with the offshore uh, picket ships that were uh, 50 miles in, around the island to warn of kamikaze attacks coming from the home islands. So we Daytime was uh, fairly innocuous, but evening and, and dawn were bad times, and that's when the uh, kamikaze wanted to try and break through. And so if we were out and about, we always get orders to snuggle up close to one of the picket ship compounds. It'd always be so... It, we lost so many ships to the kamikazes and the picket ship, single ships out there that they, they finally got smart and put two or three ships in a cluster to get more firepower. And uh, so we became part of those little things at, at times. So. And you saw the kamikazes coming in, oh, attacking? Oh, yeah. Tell me about some of those attacks. Well, what do you remember? Uh, the first one we saw was the morning of uh, invasion at uh, Okinawa. I, I just happened to be 
we were in a cluster of, of ships offshore. We had, uh, were done with the landing forces, which were unopposed at Okinawa. The Japanese had pulled back into the hills. And there was no, there was a serious uh, bombardment of the shore areas by everything they could shoot, but uh, there was nobody there. But, so we were more or less uh, idling about in a big harbor, and, and I heard a very peculiar sound of an aircraft approaching, and I looked up, and there was this Japanese plane coming in very low, and had its own special sound of the engine, and uh, it was making a beeline at a large Navy cruiser, I don't recall the name. And about the same time, the guns began to fire at the, at the kamikaze, and it finally crashed into the sea about as close to the side of the vessel as you could get without hitting it. And <clears throat> that was one of many that day. It was, uh, sometimes they'd be low, sometimes they'd be up high and dive straight down. You know? And uh, that was their mode, they were suicidal. And uh, I see p pieces flying off the airplane, they still come. <laughs> and uh, you know, we, we joined, we, th we threw a lot of ammunition at them too. You know? Did uh, you, did your ship hit any or stop any? Who knows? Not not specifically that we could take credit for, but we expended some ammunition. <laughs> no. No. no, summer '45 was very very busy, very and in between all these things. Uh, we rehearsed with the Army and the Marines uh, a landing on the home island of Kyushu. I had top secret orders in my safe saying that we were going to land on Kyushu on, I believe it was the uh, Six or something like that of November 1945. And uh, thanks to President Truman, we didn't have to do that. No. The, uh, it would have been a disaster. Why is that? Can you explain that? Many years later, I was at Pearl Harbor as a civilian going out to, as a visitor to the Arizona Memorial. I had seen it, the remains of it almost every day during the war, but my wife wanted to see it, other people wanted to see it. And there was a gentleman selling books at the uh, base that, uh, where you went out to see the Arizona. He was a retired <clears throat> breeder general of the Marine Corps and he was selling his books. He had become quite a student of the whole Pacific War. And um, I bought a couple of his books I made the casual remark that, uh, well, General, I said, I'm, I'm a veteran of the war out here. And is there anything in your books that I don't know about? And he sort of looked at me and, and yes, sir, there's a lot of things you don't know. And I said, well, I'm not surprised. But he went on to explain what the Japanese had in store for us. That, when, when and if we invaded the home islands. And it would have been a 
very brutal killing machine. They had hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, suicide boats, high explosives, that they would launch against the invasion fleet of all, anything that floated out there. And the islands were honeycombed with, with, uh, with trenches and caverns underneath. And they, they were ready. They were ready to die saving the homeland. So I, I just give great thanks to our President Truman to have the guts to pull the trigger on the atomic bomb saved our people's lives and saved Japanese lives too. So. Was that a surprise? When you heard about the atomic bomb, did you have any idea that there was such a weapon? No, no, it was a surprise to all of us. And actually we were wondering, what, what is this atomic bomb? And, you know, there were all kind of rumors, but they told us about the destruction that, that happened at, at uh, the two cities, Hiroshima and, uh, you know, and uh, it was uh, mind blowing that that much could have happened, or, but it did. I was, uh, stayed with the ship uh, approximately August 15th. 1945 was the date that the uh, last bomb was dropped, and then a week or so later, the Japanese surrendered unconditionally, and uh, lights went on the ship at night. Things got normal, and uh, I had been uh, told by uh, by dispatches that some months before, actually, that uh, I was being relieved for change of duty and that my relief would show up sometime. It did in October of 1945, and I left the ship and left the Pacific Ocean. I think our viewers will want to know that you had a very special job aboard your ship. At, <clears throat> when I joined this ship, I was one of four ensigns, the lowest ranking commission officer. And the captain was a, a, a lieutenant. Um, I can't put a date exactly to it. But uh, I was the senior of the four ensigns by date of my commission. And uh, so I became the executive or second in command, which was new to me, but you learn in a hurry. And uh, when the I became, I was promoted to a lieutenant junior grade about a year and a half later. And uh, when my commanding officer was transferred to another job, I became the commanding officer of the USS PC 578. And, uh, was eventually promoted to lieutenant senior grade, and as a, the rank I carried on my, all the rest of my active duty. And uh, I was the captain, uh, commanding officer. How old were you? Well, I was 28 by that time. And, uh, yeah. Commanding officer of a Navy vessel is a unique experience. It's a, a very unique position. The commanding officer is next to God and has been for 
all the years of the Navy. Fortunately, a lot of those things he was capable of doing is no longer allowed. <laughs> but your word is the final word. And, uh, it was very humbling. Um, and uh, regardless of anything that happened, the buck stops with the commanding officer. Yeah. So, as I say, the, the, the captain's watch is 24 7. Call you, call you day or night. What was your what was your feeling when you found out that you were going to take command of your ship? I was very happy. You were happy? I was happy about that. Yes, I I had aspired to that and was hoping it would happen. And uh, fortunately, my, my captain uh, agreed that I was capable of doing it and so recommended me. So. Um, so I, as I say, I was, it was an experience of uh, maybe beyond my years of 28, but uh, many, many regular officers, uh, and I was a reserve officer, all of, all of, most of all officers were reserve officers, there weren't enough regular Navy people to go around by far, so. There are many regular officers of the Navy that never had that opportunity, so I felt particularly uh, blessed, so to speak, to be given that opportunity. What was the distinction between reserve and regular Navy officers when you were out there on, the, on duty? None. None. Oh, I think that, I think we always carried a, a sort of a, a lower esteem from the regular officers, but not that it showed too many times. And uh, you know, we were accepted. For, we, we knew what we were doing. I think the reserve did a marvelous job starting from almost scratch in the days of December 1941. Remarkable more than anything else. So, and I, so I was very pleased to be a part of it, so. What was most challenging about being the skipper? <sighs> That's a difficult question. Um, first of all, you have to know more than anybody else does, or pretend to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You had to be compassionate. You had to be wise. You had to be harsh when necessary. And uh, most of all, you had to be above any favoritism or whatever. You know. so, I don't know if that covers it, but that's basically, and I started to get gray hair pretty soon. <laughs> I did. What was it like being at sea? Did you like it? Yes, but it was tiring. Uh, it was monotonous at times. Uh, other times there was anything but monotonous. Weather had a great deal to do with it. The time and place had a lot to do with it. And, uh, there were times that were sheer boredom, other times sheer terror. So um, did, did you enjoy the sunsets and the sunrises and those splendid oh, of scenes. Course. I saw hundreds of them. And, uh, never tired of them. Some of them were actually beautiful. And 
the dawn was uh, a time for taking celestial observations. There was no such thing as global position indicators in those days. There was a, a piece of equipment that would have solved some of the problems. It arrived aboard ship sometime in the summer of 45. It, it was still in the crates when I left the ship. And huge crates. So anyhow, pre-dawn, we were up on the bridge to take sights on, on the stars, and it was always interesting. I liked, I enjoyed doing that. It was always a great time in the morning. See the early dawn and be able to pick out certain stars to do your observations. And in the mirror, you bring them down to bisect the horizon and by stopwatch, you get the exact time by a chronometer and, and you go figure it all out by tables. It's a, what your latitude and longitude is. And if I was asked to do it today, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> I, we, uh, we compared our position daily with the uh, head, head uh, the, the main ship of the flotilla or the convoy, whoever it happened to be. They had, they had a signal, flag signal for everything, and they had run up, and we'd compare. And mostly we were within a few miles of, of, of the thing, so it was interesting. A little break in the thing, and it was a good time of the morning to be up. So. Any wondrous sights? Any what? Any wondrous sights, whales and wildlife, things like that? Uh, the sounds that we picked up on the sonar were of great interest. The whales and the uh, dolphins and other things it always had a great interest to me. You actually could hear those whales singing and carrying on, particularly around Hawaii in the, in the straits where they would come through in the, in the winter time. It, uh, other than that, I would say not. And uh, yeah, some wonder sights of storms I didn't want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Hor horrific sights. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> sure. How were your ports of call? Were they uh, fun and exciting or were they uh, business during the war? Well, the closest call was not due to enemy action. It was due to a storm. And um, we had been ordered out of the Aleutians to Pearl Harbor in December of 1942 or three. And uh, it was in late afternoon when we sailed and the weather was getting bad. And by, we were in convoy with uh, a destroyer, uh, three PCs, two SCs, and I think there was a minesweeper and the weather got worse and the seas got bigger and we were urged to get a little bit closer to each other. We did have surface radar, we could keep track of objects close by and far away too. But the seas built and built and I estimated this one to be over 40 feet and it rose and kept climbing up and it turned us over on the side. And there's a little 
instrument in the cabin called a clinometer. It measures the degrees off of dead uprights. And uh, it kept going and going and going. And uh, it got to 40 degrees. And I said, this is never going to come back. You could hear things falling and breaking all over the ship. And I think everybody stopped breathing on the bridge. And it seemed forever. We hung there and hung there. And there's little things on the side of the, of the bridge called a, a bridge wing that protect you from spray and water. And that was scooping up water. So I said, this is the end. And, uh, fortunately, it started settling the other way, little by little by little. And, you know, that was a terrible, terrible moment. I thought for sure we were going to turn right on over. And once you hit that water, you were gone. So, you know. Did any ships founder? Not at that particular time, but there was other instances in the in the Philippines that we lost ships by in storms. And an interesting little sidetrack that you know, the force of water being what it is. The great carrier enterprise was in back in Pearl Harbor after one of the big sorties earlier on in the war. I went down and somebody said, yeah, go take a look at the Big E. I said, why? You see what a storm can do to a big ship? The flight deck extends out over the bow of the ship quite a distance. And it was peeled back like a can opener. I don't know how many feet back over the bow of the ship. Just, it's amazing what the force of water would do. You know. Wow. Uh, uh, <laughs> but they did. We lost, we lost some ships in the Philippines during a big blow there. A typhoon. And, uh, and fairly big ships. Um, but uh, Tell me about coming home. What was coming home like? Well, I had, I had always hoped to steam under the Golden Gate Bridge in my own ship, but it didn't happen. I, when we relieved the command of the 578, I went ashore in Okinawa and did all the paperwork necessary and asked to have airspace to fly back to Pearl. Well, we'll get you off when we can. But uh, several days later, I was told to get out an airplane, an old DC-3, maybe call them something else, and stopped off at Iwo Jima, refueled, and got to Guam, and I uh, was told uh, you don't have enough rank to go from here on, so you're you're out of here. So I went to the local base and said, I've got a place at the officer quarters on Guam. And, uh, and if we have time to talk about an amazing story, I'll tell you what happened in Guam. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I was did nothing but drink beer, play cards, and otherwise bored with myself. And one day I went up to the operation officers and I said, I'd be happy to do something constructive. Is there something I can do? And he said, as a matter of fact, there is. And uh, he handed me a sheet of papers. These are the names of some returning prisoners of war, our people from Japan, they're in the hospital. I want you to go and interview them. Now I have to turn back the clock a little bit later. Earlier on my ship, I had a, a chief 
chief uh, motor machinist mate. His name was Weinman, and uh, he was a career Navy man. He had been in the Philippines when the Japanese overran in December, January 41, 42. And he had escaped with his commanding officer in a 40-foot motor whale boat, evaded the Japanese and made it to Australia. And his commanding officer had written a book called South from Corregidor. And the chief was getting a, a uh, royalty from this book. And he told me all about it a little bit. The name of the ship that it was left in the Philippines was a minesweeper called the USS Quail. So in my visitations at the hospital, I talked to several people and first question, what was the name of the last ship or station you were connected to before captured by the Japanese? And got to this very gaunt individual. And I, I said, T tell me, what was your last ship or station? Well, sir, I was on board the USS Quail. I, Holy smokes, how can this be? And I said, well, tell, tell me a little bit more then I'm gonna tell you a story. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, the skipper told us to be down at the docks at 8, 8, 8 p.m. or we were going to leave. And he said, I was making my way down there and I got nabbed by the Japanese before I could get there and spent all these years in captivity. I said, well, settle down here. I'm going to tell you something. And I told him the story. And he just broke down and cried. So I just thought it was a, a, a coincidence that could hardly happen. It's so, so interesting. Out of all those people. And, uh, so anyhow, I finally told the transportation officer, just put me on the first thing that flies, floats, or otherwise just get me out of here and send me to the USA. So it finally happened. I was boarded a, a beat up old Navy transport, a Liberty ship that could probably make eight knots full speed. And we proceeded from Guam to San Diego. And I don't know how many days, it seemed endless. And it was hot. It was, it was uh, cockroaches three inches long walking along in the dining room. <laughs> uh, I arrived in San Diego and the Navy had a, a, a program of release from active duty or release from the service depending on various things. And if you were married, that was a big number of points. I was single. And so I wasn't eligible to be released or whatever. So I was, had to spend another few months on active duty. So, well, we need people of command ability. And we want to do this, we want to do that, and we'll give you a command of a destroyer, destroyer escort or whatever in Japan. I said, no, I've been out there for three years. I want a shore job. And okay, we'll see what we can do. So they start running down various things. And well, how about a being an instructor in an ROTC program at, at uh, 
Northwest University. I said, that sounds like a good deal. And uh, so said, we'll sign you up. You, know, you have 30 days leave. Go home. And about an hour later, I said to myself, you know where that is? That's in Evanston, Illinois, on Lake Erie, or Lake Michigan. It's going to be cold. I haven't seen any cold weather since I left the Aleutians. That's a mistake. It's too late to do anything about it now. So that's what I did for three months until I was an instructor in naval science and tactics. I can say I was a professor at Northwestern University. And the, the young people were, were uh, under-programmed. The, the Navy was sending them to school, and they would get a commission after they graduated. So in the end of February, early March, I went to the commanding officer and said, my time's up. Please transfer me out of here. And, that's what he did. So my active duty ceased at that point, and I became a a uh, a reservist on inactive duty so, for about ten years. And and then you came home after that. I came home. Mm -hmm. What was that like when you when you came home? Saw your family, your friends. Well, it was pretty strange. And, uh, I got on a train with a bunch of other military people and went our way across the country and I got to Chicago and I had three or four hours to wait to get another train and I decided I'd call up the airlines to see if there was a plane that went to Pittsburgh and it was and I managed to get on and I have no idea how I paid for it or anything else but I called up my dad at his office and said, meet me at the airport at what time some, this evening, I'll be home. You know? And there I was, home after, after all those years. So. And it was uh, very different getting adjusted to being a civilian again, you know? but not too, not too hard. <laughs> were um w w did your friends and family seem very different after i mean those who stayed here behind uh, were they very different you know because your experiences were just so worldly they didn't uh seem that much different they they didn't want to know any details they just said whatever you want to talk about it, do so then pester me with any detail. I've written to them quite often about what my life was. They had a pretty good idea of where I was. And you couldn't tell them exactly, but uh, they, they had some, uh, my dad's family was from Steubenville and uh, his younger brothers were attorneys down there, and there was a, uh, I believe he was a news, uh, a news person of some kind who had been at Okinawa and uh, somehow or other had been aboard my ship. And uh, they asked, my uncle and I had asked something about did you ever see this PC-578? Oh, yeah, I was on it, something like that. So the word got back that, yeah, we had the news people on board quite often. It'd be, I had Ernie Pyle, who was one of the great writers of the war, came aboard uh, about a week before he was killed out there to get some hot coffee. It was always... I don't know why they wanted to drink that stuff. It wasn't very good. No. But the, the newspaper were always welcome aboard. Give them some hot 
hot chow or hot coffee or whatever else. So, but home was home sweet home. So. Dana, what would you say, as we wrap this up, what would you say um, are some life lessons that you've learned through your military experience? Um, well, it's pretty hard to put into words, but there's no book learning that can supplant it. It's uh, with people. You feel in your way, and uh, um, try not to make mistakes. Do what you think you have to do. Um, whatever you do, you don't turn back. You carry on, and uh, I can only say it was a. Uh, an amazing experience of uh, growth in my mind and, uh, and uh, a hard way to get it. It's very time consuming, <laughs> but uh, it's like uh, it was an experience that I certainly wouldn't want to repeat, but I couldn't be paid enough for it to have it. You know, you know. It's one of those things that was of profound uh, bearing on my life. So the good, the bad, the ugly, all of the above. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's been a pleasure talking about it.